All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Chris, for uh, accepting to give a talk. Today, we're very happy to have Chris Akers from MIT giving a talk about black holes as non-isometric codes. Please. Thank you, Nima. So yes, uh, this is about joint work uh, to appear, hopefully in the next month, um, with Netta, Daniel, Jeff, and Shreya. Shreya is um, a grad student of Hong's becoming a postdoc next year. And so let me start by reminding you of something that I think we're all familiar with. Um, but if I ever say something that we're not all familiar with, please ask me to slow down. Um, there might be many opportunities for you to ask me to slow down. So, and that would be totally fine. So, so holography involves what is called a holographic map, um, by which I mean, so if you imagine some situation like this, for example, which is maybe a familiar example in holography, where um, you know, this is a particular setup in ADS CFT, where I'm imagining on this, the CFT is formulated, say, on this boundary and this boundary. And in the bulk, we have asymptotically anti sitter space. Uh, and really, the, the bulk state we're thinking about has um, two black holes connected by a wormhole. So this is the Penrose diagram for this two-sided black hole. And um, it's asymptotically ADS. And uh, there's two entangled CFTs that live on this asymptotic boundary. And um, so if you, if you just think about this picture from the bulk point of view, so just in the, the gravity on the inside, um, you know, there's some states that I'll, I'll think of as a state in the Hilbert space of semi-classical gravity, which um, if you want to be really, have something really well defined, we might just consider, say, fix the background um, and then just talk about quantum field theory on that um, curved space. Uh, and then that, that Hilbert space, according to ADS-CFT, uh, is related to the Hilbert space of the boundary CFT by some map V. This is some linear map that just map, maps states in this Hilbert space to states in the boundary Hilbert space, the CFT Hilbert space. So like, uh, sort, of, sort of like I've drawn here with this arrow. So these thick blue lines are states of the, or are, you know, are, represent the boundary CFT at all different times. Uh, so the green dots are the, like a time slice of the boundary CFT. So this states in the bulk is mapped to the state on the boundary. Or state there on the boundary. Um, okay, so that's the holographic map. And, uh, one thing that's been very important recently is that we've come to understand this map and some curious features that it has in terms of quantum error correction. And quantum error correction, you know, one reason I'm not going to say too much about it. Um, I, I just want to remind you that it's a thing that's been appearing recently, uh, which basically takes the same form where, you know, it was originally conceived, say, in the 90s uh, for quantum computers, very useful there. And the the structure of quantum error correction can, can be written in a very similar way. I mean, this is one reason why we can understand the holographic map as a quantum error correcting code, where in quantum error correcting codes, you have two Hilbert spaces, a so-called logical Hilbert space and a physical Hilbert space. The logical Hilbert space is, say, a set of qubits that you want to be protected from noise. And the physical Hilbert space are the Hilbert, uh, the, say, qubits that you actually have in your lab. And um, you can say, relate, say, a, a one qubit, like a one logical qubit Hilbert space to a five logical cube, five physical qubit Hilbert space uh, with some isometry. And the, the benefit of encoding that one qubit into five qubits is that errors that say erase one of the five physical qubits uh, don't damage the logical information that you were trying to protect. So it turns out that's deeply related to the holographic map and understanding that connection, like the details of it won't be super important. Uh, the details that have already been figured out in say these papers won't be super important. But what is important is that this connection between the holographic map and quantum error correction has been very fruitful. It has explained many otherwise uh, confusing things, such as really the emergence of space time, how you can have um, two theories that are, that are dual, but one seems to have an extra spatial dimension, which naively 
brings up some seeming paradoxes, such as the radial commutativity problem, uh, but these are resolved if you allow yourself to understand the holographic map as quantum error correcting code. Good question. Yeah. So, um, what, what is, so you, you just want to say some linear map. What is V dagger V? So I go from, start from the bulk, I go to a boundary, I come back to a bulk. What is that map? Do you want yeah, to yeah, have yeah. something to do with the identity operator? Yeah, good. So, um, like, as you know, so to the extent that this is review of what was in these papers, this V should be an isometry or, you know, an approximate isometry. So that V dagger V is very close to the identity and like operator. <laughs> But one thing I would want to do in this talk, um, which is maybe what you're, what you're getting at, is I will, I will actually say, even though in historical quantum error correcting codes, V should be an isometry, so V dagger V should be like the identity, we can make sense of codes uh, in which that is far from being true in the operator norm. So, so historically, this is an isometry, but I'm going to generalize that, and that, that'll be the point. So I appreciate your question because it segues perfectly into what I'm going to say. But I mean, I, 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 maybe we could come back to this later, but uh, whatever map it, it is, almost isometer or something, I go to the boundary and come back to the bulk. Yeah. I lose some information. So maybe we could discuss at the end of the talk, what is the information that I've lost as I go to the boundary and come back? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that we'll have the... Uh... <laughs> right context to answer that question as I present more things. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, can I toss out a question? Chris, this is Ethan yeah. Fishback. Uh, does, this, does this thing uh, define uh, or specify specifically that we have three spatial dimensions rather than two or four or five? I'm interested in the possibility of more than three spatial dimensions. Is three, is that one of the predictions of this formalism? Uh, good. No, no, it's very general. It's very general. So it, it can, it can include. Okay. Holography in higher dimensions. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. So, so now that we sort of understood how the holographic map and how it connects to quantum error correction, it's natural to apply these ideas to the now familiar setting of evaporating black holes so we can learn about them. And when we do this, you know, because so far we've thought about this connection in, uh, in settings where it's uh, we don't really have black holes. So you, it's best understood so far, prior to this work, say in settings where the bulk is, say some particular state, like vacuum ADS with some perturbative excitations on top. Um, but now I'm gonna talk about black holes. What if you don't just have perturbative excitations, but you also want black holes in the bulk. And we're gonna be able to, to deal with that. Um, that's the point of this work. But when you do that, a new subtlety arises. And that new subtlety is that the holographic map for an evaporating black hole is non-isometric. And, and by this, I mean, um, this relates to what Nima was pointing out, that, I mean, it's very far from an isometry. So I, I'll explain this in more detail later, but an isometry satisfies V dagger V equals the identity. And you might have like an approximate isometry in which V dagger V is close to the identity and some norm um but but what we're going to have is that we're going to see that the holographic map actually uh doesn't satisfy something like this it's very far from it if you dagger v is going to be very far from the identity and the appropriate norm sorry just what well, well, you you probably mean far from identity and some norm that you have in mind yeah yeah i mean i mean like it's the hard to construct a norm where your favorite operator and my favorite operator are pretty close. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. So, so by this, I mean the infinity norm. So it, yeah, and it, yeah, this is going to be what I mean. Um, and, and because of this, it's going to, this poses a challenge to all of this stuff we thought we understood before. You know, we thought we understood the holographic map was related to quantum error correction and that explained a lot of things. But quantum error correction has always required sort of this condition that I'm circling, uh, at least in the conventional way of thinking about quantum error correction. 
So because this is no longer true, it's going to require us to figure out how to generalize quantum error correction to away from this setting. And arguably the main the main thing we do, and certainly the main thing I do in this talk, is uh, do that, per, like generalize the formalism of quantum error correction to to apply in such settings to make sense of such settings. So it's so we're we're gonna sort of save this connection between the holographic map and quantum error correction by generalizing the quantum error correction sufficiently. Okay, so that, those are the words that summarize my motivation. Okay, and uh, doing this, it's actually gonna have some interesting implications for the physics of gravity. And I'll, I'll just be able to comment on those a bit. Okay, so that's basically the motivation and to really set it up, uh, to start examining the holographic map in, in settings where we have black holes. Recall this example, an evaporating black hole. And recall that we have two distinct descriptions of an evaporating black hole. And, and uh, I'm gonna, yeah, so let me call one the semi-classical description. And that'll be the following. So I, here I've drawn a setup that is arguably the sharpest setup that we understand for you know, a black hole evaporating in a holographic setting. So here, I imagine that we have, say, JT gravity um, in the, the bulk here. And you know, there's, some, there's some black hole that uh, is evaporating because we've coupled the, the boundary to some bath. And this is a non-gravitational bath. So here, I'm just, you know, I'm just reminding you of the setting of these page curve calculations, where we basically allow this black hole to evaporate because we've coupled we, we've opened up these boundary conditions. So the radiation escapes. And in this description, the, the bath has radiation that's thermally entangled with this interior radiation here. So these orange dashed lines represent entanglement. And that's what I'll call the semi-classical description of an evaporating black hole. In, in contrast, there's a description that's sort of manifestly unitary because uh, this is the description that you get from applying the holographic map where you don't talk about um, the black hole in terms of its JT gravity description. You instead talk about it in terms of its SYK description. And um, in this description, the, you still have the same modes in the bath, but they can be in a different state. Like post page time, they, right, they can be entangled with each other and they're not necessarily each thermally entangled with some other degree of freedom. So I call it manifestly unitary because the, the density matrix in this description of these modes is clearly purifying. Like it, you know, it's, it's von Neumann entropy clearly follows a page curve when you use the minus trace of row log row formula. Whereas here, it, that's, not, that's not clearly true. If you just took the density matrix of these guys in this state, it would be the thermal density matrix. Um, so the minus trace of row log row wouldn't give you the right answer. You'd have to like do something else, like use the quantum extremal surface formula. So the, the so I'm just reminding you of these two setups and just pointing out that they're just related by the holographic map. So the only the only difference between them is that we've on this side uh, described everything in terms of JT, and on, on this side describe things in terms of these two SYK systems. And if we want to think about this, this holographic map as a quantum error correcting code, then we would have to say that, uh, as always, this semi-classical description is the logical description. So this, here I'm drawing a sort of cartoon of the words I'm saying, where on the left we have one Hilbert space and some uh, and a state on it, and we're sort of inputting that into the holographic map V. And on the output, we get some other Hilbert space with some state. And um, this is and and on the output, we have a physical description of the code, which is the manifestly unitary description that I described up here. So. I just a question. Okay. So in the semi-classical case, when you introduce the bath, 
are you introducing it in the vacuum and then letting it vacuum state and then letting it thermalize with JT? Is that the idea? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm just introducing this cold bath that the radiation is going to um, to empty into. Okay. So the the uh, another way of asking the question is that the uh, uh, Penrose diagram of it is that they're merged at some point. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So let's say like here, and then so they're technically not joined below this, and then uh, here there's some subtlety where it, like dumps in energy, but but I, I, I've sort of ignored all these. So okay, so. okay, good. Oops. Um, okay. So oh, sorry, just one, one more thing. Yeah. Maybe, I think you said this, but um, I, I, can you? Yeah, you 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 try to say that the bulk has to be logical because. Uh, the bulk is not unitary and want to embed it in something unitary, right? This is sort of like the logic that the boundaries is a larger one kind of thing. Hmm, that's a, yeah. Yeah, you're, I'm hesitant to agree with exactly the way you said it because in a second I'm going to argue that the bulk is actually larger. Yeah, I, 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 I don't agree with what I just said as well, but I'm just a little bit confused about the logic. So, hmm. so this is sort of the old argument, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. So here, uh, I guess so far, I've just wanted to say, uh, if we want to do the same thing we've always done, which is treat the bulk as logical or the you know the input to V, uh, then then this is like the the thing you're imagining, and uh, I do think that this is the right direction. Like we, we wouldn't want to think of, yeah. This is the right direction. Like you shouldn't think of the manifesto unitary as the logical um, for a couple of reasons. Arguably the best reason is that the quantum extremal surface formula works in a particular way. Like I haven't mentioned the quantum extremal surface formula, but for those of you who are familiar with it, you can say, take this description and compute the entropy of this radiation by using the quantum extremal surface formula in this description. And from papers from Daniel Harlow and Jeff and me more recently, we understand how the quantum extremal surface formula relates to quantum error correction. And what I just said about how it applies here tells you that this should be logical and this should be physical. Okay, so yeah, yeah sure. Said so differently, I think you're, you're saying that the physical part is the very definition of quantum gravity is the right side. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think there's many ways to say it, and you're saying it a good way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, okay. So if I'm if I want to continue to be really pedantic about it, to be clear what I mean. Um, so when I say a lot of Hilbert space, you know, I'm sort of talking about the state of the quantum fields on say this time slice. And when I want to talk about the physical state or you know the, the output Hilbert space of the holographic map, I, I want to talk about say the state of the fields on this slice so down here. So you know there's this map V that's supposed to be the holographic map, but also the some sort of quantum error correcting code is supposed to map states on this upper slice, this upper green picture to this lower green line. In, the, in this lower picture. And then having said all of that, we run into a subtlety. So this is a subtlety that we, uh, without thinking about black holes, don't run into, or at least it's not obvious that we run into it. But in this setting, we have now hit the subtlety where the semi-classical description is actually uh, bigger. The, the Hilbert space involves more degrees of freedom than the manifestly unitary description. And the argument for that is basically that in the semi-classical Hilbert space, which was you know, the state of the quantum fields here, we had in so-called bath qubits, which are which are like you know in qubits out here. And we also have that same number in the manifest unitary description, right? Because we had the radiation, you know, the modes in the bath, we had the same number. But in the semi-classical description, we have more 
at least after the page time, which is, you know, when the black hole is over half done evaporated, um, we have more qubits in the interior of the black hole than we do um, describing the black hole in the manifestly unitary description. That's the basic argument. There's there's some subtleties here to make this argument very really precise that I'm I, I would love to just sweep under the rug, which is that you know, technically the SYK Hilbert space is very large. Um, and what I really mean by there's only a or four four G qubits here in the SYK system is really that's the effective size of the Hilbert space that you would need to describe that state. Whereas in the semi-classical description, you have a much larger um, effective size of the Hilbert space. So, but, sorry. Also, another thing. I've I've heard this argument. I've been confused about this because what what you really have in either of the pictures, you always have a half quantum field theory where the entropy. These are infinite dimensional systems. These guys. Uh, you yeah, I understand that you're saying that there is a sense in which some effective dimensionality associated with the bath qubits, but that's a cartoon picture, right? With this argument, is going to be hard to make precise. Yeah, yeah, I think you can make it precise uh, by basically, yeah, at least so for sure if you let me implement a regulator where I don't really need all of this infinite space, um, so I can put an IR regulator, and then also uh, these modes are fairly hard, right, they're not arbitrarily, they're not arbitrarily short wavelength and not arbitrarily long wavelength, so I can sort of uh, identify them as well-defined qubits. And in that sense, I can sort of talk about the number of qubits I need to describe this state uh, in the ineffective field. You know, it's not like, of course, there's always infinite entropy in some region of the quantum field theory, but uh, I don't really need all those UV modes. They're, they're not really relevant to the problem. But it's, uh, yeah. It's, yeah, maybe sir. Uh, why do you need path for this argument? JTN Yeah, so um, yeah, this is just one way to make the argument. Yeah, so you're saying, like, right, so technically the holographic map uh, just relates JT to SYK. And I, I didn't, I could have tried to formulate it without the bath. Um, but I want to show that even if you include the bath, this re purifying reference system, that it still holds. But, Is that clear? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, right. But, but the question that we want to write the right? Once we don't have to pass. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I couldn't. What is, what is it going to evaporate into? It's like this as a asymmetry, like which are two digit systems that we are writing, like geometrical logical to Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, JT is like this article is always has like two digits. Right. And it's not. So I, I couldn't, I don't think I can quite hear you. So, uh, yeah, so you, you can, um, yeah, well, yeah, I see, I see what your point is. I see. Imagine, are you saying like, imagine a setup where you don't have a bath, maybe it's a small black hole. I can't exactly have that in JT, I guess, but yeah, it's like a, I'd say what I'm saying was that even at the level of isometry, like this are, even if you don't have bath, you can still write uh, you can argue that logical space, which is JT, has no smaller dimension than oh, or a higher, larger dimension than physical physical space. Yeah, I think you, that's right. Yeah, because you can just say like, uh, wait for the wormhole to grow really long, and then uh, you know I have all these modes that I can excite in the wormhole, and the SYK Hilbert space hasn't grown. That's yeah, absolutely that's true. true. Yeah, this, this is the argument that the wormhole can be very, very long in the late time, whereas the boundary description is the same dimension, right? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, Monsieur. And uh, I think that's actually like probably the best argument, but this one somehow seems more familiar to some people. So I, I have said this one, but I, you're absolutely right. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so, so for all of these reasons, uh, the quantum you know, the holographic map can't be an isometry. And so if we want to understand it as a quantum error correcting code, 
then somehow we need you know that quantum error correcting code can't be an isometry either right it's because um an isometry what i mean by that is some linear operator that doesn't change you know it satisfies this formula where you can insert it uh like v dagger v and it doesn't change the inner product uh for, for any two states by and side and um so, so the holographic map is clearly not an isometry here but as i mentioned before that's really weird for quantum error correcting codes which have historically always been defined with isometries so uh yeah, so here i'm in this paragraph i'm just sort of emphasizing that you just can't have an isometry that maps a larger Hilbert space to a smaller one. It's not even an approximate isometry in the sense that if you have a linear map from a, a larger Hilbert space to a, a smaller dimension Hilbert space, then it's going to have a kernel. There's going to be some states that it annihilates. This is just like that basic linear algebra fact that like the image, the dimension of the image plus the kernel um, sums to uh, uh, what am I saying? Sums to the dimension of the domain. So, and yeah, so that's true. So the holographic map is not an isometry. It annihilates some states, but that's very strange from the point of view of quantum error correction. Uh, people haven't developed non-isometric error correcting codes before, as far as I understand. Uh, I think Nima is now thinking about it as well. Um, but here's two reasons why non-isometric codes haven't historically been considered by quantum information theorists. So the first reason is a theoretical reason, which is that historically these error correcting codes were designed to protect all the information of the logical qubits. So if you, you know, they didn't want to throw away any information. They wanted to protect it all uh, if they could. And really only an isometry can do that because otherwise if you, you're throwing away some information about which states are orthogonal to which other states. Or, or at least you want something that's a, an approximate isometry. You don't want a linear map that annihilates some states. Uh, if it's an approximate isometry, it turns out that's like, like a V dagger V is very close to the identity. Um, say in the, the operator norm, meaning like the eigenvalue of this, or this the largest singular value of this is uh, very small then uh, it turns out this this is actually okay you can define actually very good error correcting codes in practice but um for us this condition is like very violated right it's like up to the appropriate normalization of v dagger b um it's as as big as it can be uh, because of the kernel so right so this is a theoretical reason uh you just right you just they, they wanted to protect all the information and you just can't encode all the information of some large number in of qubits into a smaller number of qubits. That's just a theorem. Uh, it's a theorem that makes sense, right? Because if you could encode a large number into a smaller number, then you could sort of encode an infinite number of qubits into a finite number. Because right, in the m qubits, you could encode n, and then those n could have already been encoding a larger number and so on. So it just, yeah. Just one, one little comment. I think what you're arguing here points to the fact that holography is telling us that there is another norm, which perhaps we're not very used to working with, that is important when we're talking about pulling the physical information from dual to boundary and vice versa. And that norm has not, we have not quite figured out what that norm is. It probably involves random matrices, I suspect, random unitaries. That's an interesting idea. I, I'm gonna at least argue with, or I, I guess the idea of the theorem I'm going to show is going to be that the, the correct sense of uh, these being close um, in holography is that it's they're close when acting on simple states. Um, okay. I'm gonna, yeah. So I think that, I like what you said. Uh, although, yeah. Some sort of like a norm that preserves simple information or something. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. That would, involve, that would involve random unitaries or something. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so that was the first reason why people haven't historically thought of it. And there's a second reason, which people haven't, yeah, which is why people haven't historically thought of these codes, which is that they're actually just hard to implement physically. So if you're interested in building a quantum computer that uses this as the code to protect your information, uh, it's not very useful because it's hard to implement. Like, so isometries, which is what have historically been used, are, are actually generally easy or often easy. So let me give you an example. So like, let's say you have some isometry V that maps um, the Hilbert space of two qubits to the Hilbert space of four qubits. So in, the, in these diagrams, this is like a, a circuit diagram where uh, each of these blue lines represents a qubits. Uh, and as you go from left to right, you're going forward in time. So you start, so basically here, you're starting with two qubits and then acting V on them. And then you have four qubits. And if you wanted to, to act this isometry in a lab, what you could do is just take your two qubits, bring in two other qubits, some ancilla qubits that have been initialized to some state Z0, act some unitary on them, and then now you have a state on four qubits. And a general isometry can be written this way. Uh, you know, the only caveat is that this U might be hard to implement, but you know, there are many Vs for which this U you'd have to use are easy. But unfortunately, implementing non-isometric codes are generally hard. Uh, so here's one way you might try and do it. You might try and say, start with four qubits and then act your non-isometric linear map on them and end up with a state on two qubits. And your idea might be, let's just take this picture and like flip it around. So, uh, so it's like, it looks like this, where you start with your four qubits here, then you act some U on them, and then you uh, project these two onto say, the zero state, leaving you with a state on two qubits. Uh, the problem is that this part is not something you can just easily do in a lab. So, you know, in a lab, what you can do is act unitaries and you can measure. And measuring can give you the zero state, but you don't get to decide when it gives you the zero state. You just measure it, and then with some probability, you get the zero, the zero state. Um, if you didn't, if you got, like say, like the, the ones state, then you will not have implemented this circuit, which, uh, <coughs> which was mathematically equal to this one. So you'd have to, say, start over, like prepare your state again, act the unitary again, and then measure here again, hoping now that you got the zero state. And if you didn't, you have to keep doing it. Uh, and so you have to do this on average uh, an exponential number of times. So exponential in the number of qubits you're projecting on, which is which can be hard, um, right? So exponential is a uh, is bad. Like that's what we call inefficient. So that's that's a practical reason why these non-isometric codes haven't really been used in labs. Uh, but even given these theoretical and practical concerns, uh, we're not concerned. Neither of them concerns us. So for the practical concern isn't that bad for us because we just care whether this code describes gravity. So if there's some non-isometric V that describes gravity mathematically, that's fine. Um, we don't care whether it's easy to implement in a lab. And actually, we're also not concerned about this theoretical reason. Uh, and this one's kind of subtle. I hope I can communicate it well. So uh, the reason why we don't have the same theoretical concern is that it's actually a feature and not a bug that not all the information is encoded into the physical state. So, so here's what I mean by that. So there's evidence that gravity sort of works this way, where we don't trust everything that the semi-classical description tells us. So, so in other words, some information is not physical. So I'll give you an example. Here it is. There's so there's some measurements. This is the spirit of the example. There's some measurements you can make on the semi-classical Hawking radiation that have no reconstruction in the manifestly unitary description. So if I just started with the semi-classical description of an evaporating black hole, and I wanted to say make some measurements on this radiation, I can come up with an operator, uh, O, such that its expectation value in the semi-classical state. So this row rad here is supposed to be the density matrix of these guys in this description. 
to which is just a thermal density matrix. Uh, that this expectation value actually does not correspond to what some observer here at the bath would measure if they made a measurement here. Uh, I, I claim that there are such O's. Um, right, so, so like those O's are, for example, if you're familiar with this, um, this will help. If you're not familiar with this, uh, I'll try and remind you. So, so like in 2013, there was this paper by Harlow and Hayden that argued that if you wanted to do the firewall experiment, the, so the AMPS experiment, uh, it would actually be computationally hard to do so. So the firewall experiment or the AMPS experiment is basically one where you have to take all the radiation on the outside of the black hole, do some unitary on it, and then um, you have basically distilled out some, some qubit that was in the interior to begin with, or you know, in, in the semi-classical description was in the interior. And uh, they argued that that's hard to do. So you, that unitary that you have to act on the radiation is hard. And um, I'm bringing up that example because that is precisely the sort of operation that, uh, so if you say try to act that unitary to, do, to distill out this interior guy to the, to the outside and then measure him, you would get something that was not necessarily consistent with this thermal density matrix. So that would be an O that would um, that would in this formula not give you the correct expectation value because the correct one is given by something that has to do with the interior. So Chris, to 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 uh, why do we need to go go through such difficult uh, complicated examples? Isn't it tr always the case that as every time we're talking about some semi-classical description, if the semi-classical Hilbert space is infinite dimensional, we consider part of that infinite dimensional Hilbert space to be junk, right? So let's say, yeah. Yeah, good. So um, certainly the like UV observables, uh, we, we're not gonna trust when we get to small enough distances. Yeah, here I was also trying to argue that there's another regime of validity that, that uh, seems to exist which is a computational one. So it seems like semi-classical gravity also uh, is not trustworthy if you're doing computationally complicated things. But, okay. Yeah. I have yeah. another question. Yeah. Um, so if you start with the setup where you already throw those junks away, do, you, do we recover our isometric code again? Ah, what what junk are we throwing away? Um, so whatever you're you're saying, this junk like non ah, yeah. um, so you're, you're trying to include this in the story, and then you try to you know throw these away after the encoding. But if you do yeah. it before the encoding, do we recover the isometric picture? Yeah, that yeah that should be true. I because yeah. basically this junk is. Um, yeah, this all these null states, these states that are annihilated by the holographic map. And so if you throw those away, then now you have a, a map that's not uh, not isometric. So it's, yeah, you have an isometric map now. OK, OK. I see. And doing that would it be like uh, basically equivalent to performing the holographic map. Yeah. OK, so yeah, so the last thing I wanted to say about this example. So right, this example was just to say there's some observables that we think a semi-classical observer can in principle measure, um, but we shouldn't trust the semi-classical state to give the right answer, if that makes sense. And those are complicated yes. ones. Yeah. I have a couple of questions, and I think they're related to Peter's question. Um, at, at the level of non isometric maps, um, I don't think there is any confusion, but it only gets surprising or confusing when you Related to quantum error correction. That's right. That's right. Could I have just said that this, there is no uh, 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 there is no connection to quantum error correction here? Yeah. Good. Okay. So um, that would raise a bunch of new questions. So one question is, 
how are we supposed to think about the emergence of space time behind black hole horizons? Right, so quantum error correction like helped us understand the emergence of space time from like CF the CFT to you know vacuum ADS plus perturbations. But it seems like there's a description of black holes that involves an interior, and probably error correction is a part of that story. A more a sharper argument is that it seems like even in these cases, error correction uh, works. Like we under we can understand the quantum extremal surface formula as a feature of error correction. And it seems to be a valid way to compute the entropy of, say, the, the modes here in the physical picture using uh, this picture. So, so the, the quantum extremal surface formula itself is evidence that quantum error correction works. Another way of saying that is that, like, you, you know, we can, it tells us that you can reconstruct interior operators out here, which is like a error correction. Yeah. Uh, then I'm confused, like, what errors are we exactly talking about? Because they can't be erasure as it usually story. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, in fact, yeah. And so, no, in fact, you can, uh, it's still an erasure code. Yeah, it's still an erasure code, even though it's non isometric. Because, for example, you can reconstruct, right? So, these guys, like in this picture, operators here, are encoded uh, in, like the union of the SYK system and the VAT. And so you can like, as we often say in these page curve calculations, um, you can you can after the, the page time reconstruct operators that were in the interior on just the bat, where you've erased the SYK system. So that's still error correction, uh, and that's one way of saying why that should still like we should still understand this as an error correcting code. Sorry, uh, might be able to come back to this later, but. You, you're going to be able to reconstruct approximately, right? Yeah, it, it, yeah approximately. It's approximately. So you could ask approximate with respect to one what norm. And I think the answer to that is that whatever norm with respect to which V dagger V is almost identical. Um, I, th I think this is, this is, I mean, V dagger V minus identity controls how good of an reconstruction you're going to get. So it's generically the case. So it's uh, yeah. Well, actually, what we're gonna uh, do is like it's gonna be a good reconstruction. It it's gonna be a good what we call state specific reconstruction, and in the normal norm, like in the usual. So it's gonna look like this, where um, where like this is the so U tilde reconstructs U, and um, this is the Hilbert space norm. So like these two states are close. Um, are, are you going to say that these symbols, that the, the Hilbert space that these simple vectors span is very low dimensional? Uh, actually, no. Yeah, it's going to span. They're going to like span the entire input Hilbert space, but they're going to be, uh, yeah. So it's it's they're going to span the entire input Hilbert space. Yeah. Okay, I'm very confused. Then. Okay, let, let's get to that. Okay. Oh, yeah. So okay. These are a great set of questions because um, so right the in the language of quantum error correction this way to understand what's going on here is that these O's are just not reconstructable. That's that's why they're not physical. So there's no physical reconstruction of them. So this suggests that if we want to come up with some codes that are like the codes relating the semi-classical description to the manifestly unitary description. Then we want to come up with some non-isometric codes in which the set of reconstructable operators are those we trust to be physically meaningful in the semi-classical description. And so now, what set is that? Well, as I've sort of tried, tried to argue, uh, there's been evidence that the semi-classical, that semi-classical gravity is trustworthy for computationally simple operators. And of course, like low energy, right? You don't want to talk about Planck scale energy operators. Okay, so that's the motivation for proving this theorem. And this is the heuristic version of, of the theorem, and then I'm going to explain it in more detail. Uh, but if you get one thing out of this talk, it, it, sh it should be this. So this is the, the, the main results, and then you know, there's a bunch of cool things we proved that build on this. But in this talk, this is the main result. It's that there exist highly non-isometric codes, meaning like codes with a very large kernel. So there's these that annihilate uh, a lot of the Hilbert space. 
the logic with open space, such that all simple operators are reconstructible. So these are computationally simple in a way that I'm going to explain, um, but not necessarily the complex operators. And by reconstructable, I'm, I'm going to mean something that may be different from what you're used to, which is the regular error correction sense. I, uh, here I mean in a state specific sense, which I'll define. And this is quite different from regular codes, not just because it's not an isometry, but also because the set of operators that we're interested in reconstructing don't form a sub algebra. Yeah, usually codes that they talk about there's a logical subspace or a, there's a code subspace or there's a code sub algebra. Um, here, the set of reconstructable operators are not a subalgebra because, for example, you can multiply many simple operators together and create a complicated operator. Which Sorry, is, just in standard in a standard error correction, the moment error correction is approximate, uh, there is no subalgebra either. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because in that case, the errors build up. Here, uh, I'm going to mean something. It's actually not for that exact reason that it, that. Okay, yeah. Breakdown happens. Okay, so yeah, in other words, information accessible with a simple quantum circuit on the logic of Hilbert space is preserved. So that information is preserved. The information that's not preserved, and there had to be some information not preserved because it was not an isometry. The not preserved information is that, that you have to use a complicated operator to access. So we shouldn't trust what the logical state suggests about anything with high complexity. So let me say this more precisely. So, so let me define a gate set. So a gate, by a gate, I just mean you know the usual notion of a gate acting on some qubits. So here we'll say like uh, it's going to be a finite set of unitaries in SU four. So a finite set of gates that act on two qubits, and we're going to assume all to all connectivity. Uh, these assumptions don't really matter because of the solovic and Taiyev theorem, where all gate sets are basically equivalent. And if you multiply many gates together, then you can make circuits. So this is my will be how I would draw a circuit where you act gate one and then gate two, etc. And as I said, we're going to be interested in non-isometric codes where you have some linear map V that's going to be our quantum error correcting code, <clears throat> and the input will be say n qubits, and then the output will be a smaller number m qubits. And uh, to, the, to like, let me make it explicit what the map is, like how this sort of code relates to the evaporating black hole setting we've been discussing. So, so if I had sort of this setup, that would be a model for the evaporating black hole, where we start with say some state, let's call it omega. Like, uh, and that's a state on say, these four qubits that are about to have V acted on them and say some extra qubits. Um, and these extra qubits you should interpret as the, like the bath. And then these qubits that have V acted on them, that's like the JT qubits. So, and then omega can be entangled, right? So in our evaporating black hole case, it's some thermal, entangled state between like these interior guys and the exterior guys. So, so this is like the input, yeah, the, the logical Hilbert space with like a, a bath and gravity. And the output is, uh, the output of V is like the SYK system. And the bath, of course, it's acted on trivially by V. And so that, that's the relationship. And uh, when I say reconstruction, what I mean is the following. So I'm going to be talking about reconstructing gates, like uh, circuits that look like this, where like, let's say we start with omega, and then we act some unitary in the semi-classical description. That's like acting gates over here. And these gates, you know, could just act in the interior, or maybe they like act in the outside or on both. Um, so sorry, but, I, I have a question about the uh, picture drew uh, on, on top. So where is the encoding? What is encoded? What can you? So gravity is encoded. No, 
Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so yeah, gravity is a yeah, gravity is like these qubits. So all these qubits are in the JT system, and then uh, these qubits that I've circled at the bottom, these are in the bath. So th this looks like to me, it looks like an encoding of gravity in SYK plus bath. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I guess technically I, I might say it's like gravity. Yeah, gravity is encoded into SYK. Or you could say like gravity plus the bath is encoded into the SYK plus the bath. Ah, okay, okay, good, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so so if I consider some general unitary here acting in the semi-classical description, I'll say that I am able to reconstruct that unitary if there exists some U such that instead of acting that unitary in the semi-classical description, I could have acted that unitary in the physical description. Uh, and here I'm just going to talk about, I'm going to allow, allow myself to act on both the SYK system and the bath. Um, just, and I could later consider acting unitary just on the bath, but for now I'm going to do the simpler thing of acting on both. Uh, and I'm going to say that I have reconstructed these uh, if there's a unitary for which the state here and the state here that kind of output on both cases are very close in the Hilbert space norm, like the Euclidean norm in the states. I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you say state specific, does that mean it's U depends on omega? Yes, U depends on omega. Yeah, exactly. That's how it, it's allowed to depend on omega, which is, uh, yeah, that's important. Okay. Um, this might be a trivial question, but does U depend on B? Yes, you can also depend on V, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, you can depend on V, it can depend on these guys, and it can depend on Omega. I see that. Um, is there any um, simple way to see how, like, why U depends on Omega, or are you just saying that if the series construct only works for a certain choice of both state? Yeah, so um, this, yeah, so it's it can depend on Omega. There's actually a yeah, it's very interesting why we we are allowing it to depend on omega. So one reason is that you can prove there's no such thing as um, good reconstructions for general non-isometric codes where this U is not allowed to depend on omega. Okay. Um, so this is like the best you could hope for. That's the basic reason. So do, do you have to uh, assume that U is uh, supported on, could, could you restrict to a case where U is either supported on the bath or SYK, or do you, it's essential for you that it's supported on both? Uh, you can restrict to where it's just supported on the bath or SYK. The rules about when those will be reconstructable are actually quite different from what I'm going to present. Um, so this theorem I'm going to present is the, is the, arguably more important one for understanding certain physics. So for example, understanding which of these unitaries are um, represent physical information. Uh, we just want it to be reconstructable at all anywhere, and that would be this setting. But it is a very important question. You know, when is it reconstructable on just the bath? You can also analyze that. This theorem is not about that. Yeah, because those are the simpler cases to think about. Anyway, yeah, thanks. Uh, Chris? Yeah. When we were discussing your paper, we were confused about one thing. Um, it was like, can't I be defined U this way? Like, U acting on V omega gives you the state that you wanted? Uh, you can yeah, yeah. define U this way, right? Yeah, this is also how we do it in my paper with Jeff, yeah. Then, uh, oh, see. The point is that, so what, what was that is saying that what we were confused about is that you can always define a linear operator called U that takes these guys to those guys. I guess he's right. saying that. It's also like, I mean, you can define a unitary that does that, right? Because you are not telling me that, you're telling me only the extent on one of state, not the other state. So I can always find a unitary that does that. Uh, so, but uh, yeah, so here, one thing, Right, so it's important that it's unitary, and also it's 
uh, non-trivial because this is not an isometry. So if this were an isometry and then I, had, I was allowed myself to act unitary on the entire output, then it would be trivial. But here it could like annihilate the state. And there's, for example, if these guys annihilated the state or you know, ch change the state to the kernel and then V, so V would annihilate it, um, then of course there'd be no unitary that could do that. Okay. Yeah, this, this is what we got. We we're confused about. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's going to be not not trivial that this is possible. Okay. And um. So I'm sorry, can I ask one naive question? Yeah. Um. In this non-isometric case, or maybe co-isometric case, why why should it be like unitary? Like why can't we have like any linear operator? The question is because um, the reason I am asking is this because your like an B annihilates like other subspaces, meaning that the boundary Hebel space uh, has a direct sum structure where you have a uh, range of B and then the orthogonal part of B, right? So these two should be disjoint. So in that case, like any linear, so it's not cyclic anymore, but it's cyclic only in the subspace. Like a range of the V. So I guess like any linear operator could be reconstructed. So um or you yeah, you let's see. So yeah. I'm not sure, sure I've hundred percent understood the question. I I I, yeah. I will say that it's a, a highly non-trivial condition for when this holds and it um like this is also the thing that guarantees that like the quantum minimal service formula holds. Yeah. Uh, and it's slightly more, it's more trivial if you allow this to be a general operator. So let me, let me try to paraphrase uh, what was we were saying is that what, what goes wrong if I assume U is approximate unitary? What in your physical principles of ABS if it falls apart? If you mm -hmm. Good, yeah. I guess what goes wrong is the uh, the error correction interpretation. Um, there's a there's a rigorous error correction interpretation of this sort of reconstruction, where um, say like physically in a lab, what it would mean is like there's some physical process, some physical like some unitary that I want to implement on my logical Hilbert space. And uh, the question is, can I implement that evolution given my physical qubits? And this condition ensures that that is the case. There's some unitary that I can actually act in my lab that implements this unitary in the logical Hilbert space. Uh, if, if I didn't demand that this was a unitary, but oh, then you wouldn't have that interpretation and um, so physically, it maybe like it seems a little weirder to me, and then also, it would certainly be a little bit more trivial. It would be easier to get it in a, a system, and I'm not sure what nice properties it would imply for you. Like it wouldn't imply a quantum extremal surface formula, for example. Okay, perfect. I, I think I perfectly answered my question. I have just one last bit of it. The approximate equal you write is that in Hilbert space norm or? Yes, Hilbert space norm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. So um, yeah, let me go quickly because my time is basically up. Um, so what, I, what I'm basically going to argue is that I'm going to just show you a class of Vs. So these are non-isometric codes um, that have all these properties that we want, where basically they're, they have this huge kernel. And nonetheless, any simple unitary is reconstructable. So that means that any, any uh, sequence of gates that's not too long is reconstructable in this sense. And what's important about, like, so you know, you ask, what's the difference between a short sequence of gates and a long sequence of gates? The difference is that there's only a small number of short circuits. So if I, if I want to ask how many circuits there are of, of this form where I act K gates in any way, uh, that number is bounded from above by this exponential. So it's the important part here is that it's two to the K. So two to the number of gates you're acting. Uh, there's this, this extra factor multiplying K. It's not so important, but remember N is the number of input qubits. 
but it has a log, so that's why it's not so important. And then G is the number of dates in our set, but it also has a log and we're keeping it fixed, so it's not that important. Um, and the proof is very easy. You just literally count all the ways that you can apply K gates, each choice from G options applied to any two out of N qubits, which is this number, and then you can bound that by this. So again, the important part is that there's only two to the K gates, or two to the K circuits of K gates. And then the main theorem stated more precisely is this one, which is that, uh, so V is just this thing. What this is, is it takes N qubits, the N qubits they are your input, it acts, uh, a unitary on them. So that unitary, I'm going to, it's going to be a fixed unitary, but, but like to, to prove, yeah, it's going to be chosen at random. So we're going to pick one at random. And then the theorem will say with a certain probability that unitary you chose um, is good. And most of them are going to be good. So it takes the n qubits, it acts a unitary on them. Then on the output, it post selects or you know, projects uh, a bunch of them onto the zero state. So that's like, you know, leaving you with M qubits. And uh, so it's, a non, it's not my symmetry because it goes to a smaller number. And this actually will usually um, destroy the normalization. So to keep it normalized, at least on average, um, we include this extra factor. And that's it, that, that's what V is. And the theorem is just a statement a uh, proof about this V. And what it says is that such a V does allow you to do really good reconstruction in this, the sense that I described above. Uh, let me scroll up. In this sense, really good reconstruction is possible with this V of all short circuits. So that's circuits that are sub exponential in length. So let me say, like, show you what I mean. So <clears throat> consider a, like a circuit. Consider all circuits of length k. Uh, k, and this k is arbitrary. It doesn't have to be short, but you'll see that this only gives something non-trivial when k is small. So consider all circuits of length k. We can reconstruct all of them with this probability. And this probability is, is close to one if k is small, and it's not close to one if k is big. So it's, the probability is one minus to uh, this term with two factors. So the first factor is literally the number of circuits of length K there are, which remember was just two to the K. And the second factor, so th this guy's big, right? This first factor is big. The second factor is small and that's the key. It's really small. It's doubly exponentially small in M. M is the number of output qubits. And uh, it's doubly exponentially small. This epsilon here is the like how good you want your reconstruction to be. That can also be exponentially small in M, right? So you could have it be like two to the minus beta M, where beta is like one tenth or something. Uh, then you know, then this is still this this whole term here is still doubly exponentially small in M. So it's you have something that's like doubly exponentially small in M times something that's just exponentially big in K. So you see that if we allow all circuits exponent like with so if we allowed circuits like where k was exponentially large in m then this theorem would be trivial but if as long as k is not exponentially big in m this theorem says something non-trivial that you can reconstruct all the circuits with high probability um that's the statement of the theorem i, I guess i don't have time to give you the proof sketch, but really it just involves, like you write down the statements for the reconstruction error, you um, show that it's good on average, but then you uh, average over the use from the R measure, but then you wanna say it, you know, for all simple circuits, for all circuits simultaneously. So you have to use um, concentration of measure and uh, the, the, um, which we call it the uh, union bound. So, so happy to say more about this, but basically use concentration to measure plus the union bound uh, to get this probability that we had. And um, sorry for skipping the proof, but 
That's the idea of it. And so to recap, the main result was this theory. We have demonstrated that there is a, a new kind of code in which the encoding map is non-isometric, like has a big kernel, and in which all simple unitaries are reconstructable, but general unitaries aren't. And here's three things that I didn't have time to mention, but are very interesting, I think. Um, so first of all, in this model, it's clear how the information gets out and why the quantum extremal surface formula computes the page curve in these evaporating black holes. And the, uh, the basic mechanism is that the post-selection you do, right, where you're like, after acting U, you, act, you post-select on zero, that quantum teleports the information out to the back. And that mechanism, this is the second thing, that mechanism is, is mathematically similar to the final state proposal of Horowitz and Malvasana. But here, it arguably has a different physical interpretation because instead of the post-selection happening because of weird quantum gravity effects at the singularity, it's happening in the holographic map. And um, one, another important difference is that our model has a well-defined regime of validity. It, you know, you should only expect it to, like, that things work nicely and semi-classically when you act computationally simple operators. Whereas in Horowitz and Maldesena, there was no um, mechanism that motivated that. Okay, and the last thing is that um, this very interestingly provides some modified measurement rules for semi-classical observers. So, the, so it tells them, like, basically it tells them that um, quantum mechanics is a good approximation for their measurements, as long as the measurements are computationally simple, but there's large, there can be large deviations if they're gonna do a computationally complicated measurement. That's the, uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention, but didn't have time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris, for the wonderful talk. Are there questions? Uh, I have a one, maybe this is also a naive question, but so um, since V annihilates, uh, since V has a large kernel, on the boundary Hubble space, you have direct sum structure, right? Now, what is this? Uh, uh, subspace, uh, like does it have like physical uh, interpretation for this subspace? Uh, the subspace of the of the logical Hilbert space. Uh, that... subspace of the boundary boundary Hilbert space. Uh, so, so it could like the image of the map actually could be yeah. the entire boundary Hilbert space. So in this model, it generally is. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's sort of different from. Um, yeah, the terms are weird because yeah. You, in usual quantum error correction, the image of the holographic map is a subspace. Yeah. Physical. So here that doesn't have to be the case. Right. Okay. Um, so I oh okay. So my oh maybe uh, maybe I was confusing. Um so are you saying that the range of this uh you know, the space of sorry, range of the this non-isometric map is a whole boundary of the space? Yeah, so in this model it is. Uh, like oh, or it can be, but uh, yeah, it, in gravity, I'm not committed to that. Um, but it could be, yeah. So, well, what, what, uh, sorry. Yeah. So that well, what I understood from what you what you said is that what you're doing what the, this current if I'm wrong, but am I summarizing this properly by saying that. The observation is that if I have um, n qubits, if I apply a random unit, random projection on this n qubits, I can compress them exponentially. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's essentially what's going on here. Yeah, so this is, this is okay. And if that's the case, I think what you are dealing with is a probabilistic average. It's a random encoding. What you're squeezing in is not you're not you're not compressing n qubits into smaller number of qubits, but there's an ensemble interpretation for the boundary theory. There, I don't think you can say these words without. You, I don't think there exists any 
encoding of this type without injecting randomness of some type. So it's an R measure, or you need something that's extremely has you know Levy's lemma. You're Levy, using Levy's yeah. lemma. Yeah, there's certainly randomness in um, this theorem in the sense that we are picking this U at random. That's true. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, so this this falls in the category of random codes, which you, what you have is like sort of you could there you could do random codes and people have studied random codes. They're they're all random average isometric codes, which is not your case, right? Your case is different. You're averaging projections, which nobody would call a code, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I want to understand these. Yeah, cause you were mentioning this before um, to me, and that's yeah, that's really insightful, and I, I want to understand these better. I'm not. Yeah, like it, it, I'm wondering if those codes, um, like here, the the theorem basically tells you that there is there like there exists a U that does this job, where like I could have just picked that U, um, it would work, and uh, I can just forget about all Sorry. other U's. Sorry, what, what, what does that even mean? Uh, there exists a U. Yeah, because um, you're you're arguing the probability of a random u is sorry that if, if you pick a root, the probability that it behaves a certain way is something right is larger than something. Yeah. So. Right. So and because right so essentially because it's not zero, it um, that means that there is a u that satisfies the property that you can do epsilon good reconstruction of all circuits of length k. Maybe another way of saying what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is, are, are you familiar with the paper of Thomas Vedic and friends? Yes. Yeah, with the USC people. Uh, perhaps. Uh, overlapping qubits, is that? Overlapping yeah. qubits, right. Is the, is, is the result of the same flavor? It's of the same flavor, except they are interested in uh, what I would call state independent reconstructions. So like they're... Oh, I see. Okay. And then what I would I would say we're different because we um, are interested in states specific reconstructions like this. Oh, I see. So I should be focusing on the reconstruction and the type of reconstruction to see the difference. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Chris, so here you're using so the definition of simple operators are two local product unitaries, right? So does your theorem break down if you take three local operators or even a mixture of two local and k local ones? Uh, good question. No, so yeah, so um, all I, what, what I meant by simple was, right, any uh, sub-exponential product of these two local unitaries. And um, there's this solovic Kataev theorem that maybe you know about where I could choose a different gate set so instead of two local unitaries, like it, like it could have three local. And um, the number of gates that it takes one gate set to achieve a unitary is only a polylogarithmic factor different from any other gate set. That's so, so the three, yeah, the number of, in both cases, whether or not it's three local or two local, uh, if it's sub-exponential in one, it'll be sub-exponential in the other. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Chris once again. Thank you so much. This was super clear. I learned a lot. Um, oh, thank you very much. This was, yeah, this, these were good questions too. It was very fun to give this talk.